We're going to take the, the next five weeks and we're going to dive into a book of the Bible called First Peter. And First Peter, I believe, is going to be life-changing for us. I think God has something he wants to say to us in this. And as the last few weeks and months that I've been preparing for this series, you know, one of the thoughts that has come to my mind regularly is that life isn't always about conquering, but oftentimes it's about continuing. Let's say that again. Life isn't always about conquering. Oftentimes, it's about continuing. Yes, we are more than conquerors, but we've also been called to stand firm. We've also been called to endure, to continue. And this series is here to encourage you not to give up, not to quit, not to run away, but to continue. The word continue means to persist, to remain, to carry on. Another word that would describe continue that we see a lot and we'll see it a lot in this book is the word endure. Everybody say endure. Endure. The word endure means to hold out against. How many know that in 2020 we have been called to hold out against some things? Come on, we have been called to endure through some things. Uh, Conforming to the patterns of this world. We have been called to hold out against conforming to the patterns of this world. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. Come on, we have been called to hold out against persecution, to endure persecution. I don't know who told you that when you give your life to Jesus, it's all downhill from there, but can I tell you that as a believer, you will face persecution, and we are called to endure. We are called to hold out against division in the body. Come on, we should be a church that is in unity. We have been called to hold out against false teaching. I don't know about you, but I want to make sure that our church is preaching the true gospel. That we preach that Jesus came down and he died on a cross for our sins. And he went to the grave. And for three days he spent his time in hell. But he rose on the third day. And now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And you can't earn his love. You can't earn salvation. But he did it for us. And by grace we have been saved. Come on, we have been called to hold out, to endure, to continue. What good is it to conquer if you never learn to continue? What good is it to gain ground if you can't stand your ground? I believe that continuing in the temporal leads to an inheritance in the eternal. Continuing in the temporal leads to an inheritance in the eternal. And we're going to dive into 1 Peter chapter 1. I encourage you to bring your Bibles over the next few weeks. And um, I encourage you to read 1 Peter over the next few weeks. I believe God has things he wants to say to us. And how cool would it be that if we as a body decided that over the next few weeks we are going to seek God to see what he has to say to us. How many believe that if we begin to seek God, his word says that if we seek him, we will find him. That as a body, if we come together in unity and we begin to say, God, show us what you have for us. Show us what you need from us. That God will respond. And I love it. Last week, Pastor Tom uh, began to talk about over the next few weeks and months, he's going to begin to prepare and seek God and pray and fast. And I encourage you to do the same. That God has something for us in the coming year. He has plans for you, hopes for you, a future for you. And we need to seek God to see what it is he has for us. So over the next few weeks, open your Bible and read 1 Peter with us. Read it every day. Read the chapter that we're on. Next week we'll go to chapter 2. Read chapter 2 all next week and begin to ask the Holy Spirit, show me things. Show me secret things and hidden things, great and mighty things. Holy Spirit, show me how to apply this to my life. And guess what? He will do it. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. And I'm going to go ahead and just kick it off. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit 
For the obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Right off the bat in verse 1 and 2, we gain context. And I need you to know that this context is important. Context helps bring into focus the picture that God is trying to paint. Without context, you get a blurry picture. Yes, you might be able to see some things, but the picture is blurry. You ever handed your phone to someone and said, hey, can you get a picture? And when you get it back and you look at it, it's blurry. Well, that's not what I wanted. (laughs) Well, when we don't get context, we don't get what we need. Context helps to put in focus the picture. It's important to know who was writing this letter. It's important to know who the letter was written to. It's important to know the purpose of the letter being written. Context is important. And right off the bat, we get context in verse 1 and 2. Who wrote the letter? Well, it's it's pretty obvious. Verse 1, it starts off, first letter, first word, Peter. (laughs) Peter writes the letter. He basically starts his letter off and says, hey, guys. It's me, Peter, and I'm writing to you. Peter is the author, and and that might not mean much to you, but it's actually pretty encouraging to me. Because how many know that Peter had some pretty good days, but he also had some pretty bad days? (laughs) How many know that that Peter was was a good guy, but then there's also some days you're like, who are you? What are you? How are you following Jesus? And I mean, on his good days, on his good days, He's water skiing without a boat, right? He's walking on water. Look at that, you know. On his good days, he's he's leading thousands to Jesus in the early church. He's preaching to them. And it's amazing on on his good days. But how many know that Peter also had some bad days? That on his bad days, he he was cussing at at little girls. (laughs) I don't know if you know that. Peter's known as the cussing disciple. (laughs) How many know on his bad days, he denied Jesus, his best friend, three times? Uh, Probably one of his worst days, you know, he's he's sitting there and, and Jesus turns and looks at him and says, Get behind me, Satan. Now, I don't know what you have to do. For Jesus, who is God, who is love, to look at you and replace your name with Lucifer. But can I just tell you that if God can use Peter, God can use me. Come on, if God can use Peter, he can use you. God can use you. One guy said when it came to 1 Peter, he said that God can do perfect things with imperfect people. You know what that does? That includes us all. Because there isn't one person who's here today that is perfect. There isn't one person who walked in here today that has everything together. If God can use Peter, God can use me. I love that. And what we find out is Peter's the author, and then we find out who he was writing to. It was This letter was for a specific group of people. It's written to a group of churches in Asia Minor. He's writing to five different churches, and it's right here in the beginning. It's to the church in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia. It's one church, but multiple locations. See, multi-site church isn't a new thing. It's kind of how we got started. That is one church in multiple locations, and Peter is the overseer. He's the the pastor. He's the apostolic leader of these churches. So he's writing to the church, and this is a letter for those people. And and listen, this this book, this Bible, isn't a book of what has happened. This is a book of what always happens. That what the Spirit of God was saying to them, the Spirit of God is saying to us right now. That yes, it was for a specific group of people, but we too can pull truths and principles out and apply them to our lives right now. This book is for you today. And we see it's a letter for a specific group of people, and uh, what the Spirit was saying then is what he's saying now. And 
The setting of this letter is, is pretty important. It's a, the setting is in ancient Roman, during the ancient Roman Empire. And, and uh, you know what I found fascinating as I was studying and reading up on this is I believe that you, you, know, you might be able to find some similarities in this with where we're at right now. Just, just listen to the uh, couple facts about the ancient Roman Empire. It was uh, a superpower. That in this time, the ancient Roman Empire was a superpower. That it had the greatest and largest military of its time. That it had the most diverse culture. Does it sound familiar to anybody? That this place was so amazing that people from all over the world would come to it to live. Why? Because it's the dream. You can start from nothing and work your way up to something. This place was amazing. But during the time that this letter was written, the Roman Empire was actually self-destructing from the inside out. It sound familiar to anybody. <laughs> that it was self-destructing from the inside out. That, that there were so many cultures, ways of thinking, ideologies. And everyone was fighting over which way was the right way. That this is how we should do it. No, this is where we should go. No, this is what we should do. And in the middle of that, there's a small group of people called the way. The way is what we would call Christians today. That they were a minority group in the middle of everything going on, trying to follow Jesus and his way of doing life and his way of thinking. And Peter is writing to this group of people who in the midst of immense pressure, he's trying to encourage them to don't quit. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. You can continue. Don't let the division out there become the division in here. Peter is writing to this group of people. I know the struggles you're facing. I know the pain that you're encountering. But I walked with Jesus. I have an eyewitness account of how we are to continue, of how we are to endure. And if you follow, and if you endure, and if you continue, there is real life in Jesus. There is hope in Jesus. There is healing in Jesus. You just have to continue. Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, it's, it's where the gospel originated, but today, modern-day Turkey is actually one of the most unchurched places in the, in, in the world. So it doesn't really matter how we start, it's can we continue? Can you continue? He's writing to these churches. He's writing to the church. I need you to continue. I need you to keep going. And he begins the letter by saying to those who are elect exiles. And I want to focus on those two words real quick. Elect Exiles, because that's important and it's crucial if we're going to continue over the next five weeks that we see ourselves in this text. Elect exiles. Number one, he says, You are elect. Here's what that simply means you are chosen by God. The word elect simply means you are chosen by God. He found you. Once I was lost, but now I am found. The Bible puts it one way that while we were denying him, he was choosing us. We are elect. You are chosen. And there's large doctrinal debates about this with predestination, which basically means that God before the beginning of time decided who would get saved and who wouldn't get saved. And I don't uh, prescribe to that doctrine. I believe that God is sovereign, but man is responsible. That God is sovereign, but he gave us a choice. God chose you, but you still have to make a decision. You are elect. And I, and I get that from verses like John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. We're a part of the world. That whosoever, I think I fit into whosoever, would believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You have a choice today. You have a choice. You were chosen, but God gives you a choice. I also get this, this phrasing from Peter himself in 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So not wishing that who should perish? Any. 
but all should reach repentance. God's mercy, his grace, his love is for you. You have a choice today. It's your decision. You are elect. Now, as we go through this, this, this letter, you're going to see the word elect, and you're going to see the word predestined, and don't let it scare you, but let it encourage you that you were chosen by God, that he picked you, that he had this moment in his mind at the beginning of time. We are chosen by God. And he says, you are elect exiles. So yes, we are chosen, but we're also in exile. This is what it means to be a believer, that you are chosen by God, but you're a stranger in this world. That we are misfits in society. It's a picture of the cross, really, that my my, my vertical relationship with God, I, I'm chosen, but my horizontal relationship with the world, I'm in exile. I'm a misfit. I don't belong here. And, and this place is not our home. Listen, you will be accepted by God and you will be rejected by man. It's because you are an exile. We are an elect exile. And, and, and it reminds me of Jeremiah 29, 11. I love this. We all know the verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts and plans I have for you, thus saith the Lord. Plans to give you a hope and a future, not to harm you. We love that verse. And I really enjoy when people say, oh, you're taking that out of context. You don't understand what they were going through. Well, let's look at what they were going through. Because in Jeremiah 29, it starts by saying, these are the words of the letter to the surviving elders of the exiles. Interesting. They were in exile, and Peter is letting us know that we are in exile. So we might have some similarities here. And it says, thus says the Lord of hosts to the God, the God of Israel, to all the exiles. Oh, so apparently he's talking to people like us. And it says, when exile is over, I will come and visit, and I will fulfill my promise and bring you back to this place. Kind of sounds like Jesus. For I know the thoughts and the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a hope and a future. Listen, we sinned. We were put in exile. Jesus came back and fulfilled the promises. And now we are on our way back home. We are in exile. This is not our home. Have you ever sensed that? That this world is broken and hurting and we don't belong here. This is not our home. Heaven is our home. It reminds me of the church. Then We started the church 15 years ago. And I cannot tell you how many times people have come into the church and they say, it feels like home. Hey, raise your hand if you've ever sensed that. If you've ever, man, it just feels like home. Could it be that that's not just a physical shared experience, but that might be a spiritual shared experience? Could it be that the church is actually the closest thing we have on earth to heaven? And, 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 and that's why the fact that I'm in exile, that's why I want to build God's house. That's why I want to build this place. Why? Because it's the closest thing we have to heaven. Earth is not your home. Heaven is your home. We don't belong here. It's kind of like the U.S. Embassy. I don't know if you've ever been out of the country or if you've ever had to go to the U.S. Embassy, but the U.S. Embassy is a physical location that's placed in a separate country. A physical location that's placed in a separate country. And although it's a physical location in a separate country, it doesn't function with that other country in mind. It has a, a different set of rules. It functions under a different authority. And just like the church, or just like the U.S. Embassy, the church is the embassy of heaven. That we are placed in a different country, but we don't operate under this authority. We have another authority. We have another power. We have another government that we offer, which is heaven. This place isn't our home. And this is why Peter is writing to the church. He's saying that the division out there, the division that's creeping in, should not be the division in here. That the problems out there should not be the problems in here. 
Come on, that the arguments taking place out there should not be the arguments taking place in here. Why? Because we have the answer. We have the solution. His name is Jesus. Come on. Don't bring the world's problems into God's house and try to replace the solution of Jesus with the problem. The, the world shouts the problems, but let's not let it silence the sermons of the Savior. His name is Jesus. We are elect, but we are in, in exile. We're caught in this tension, and this is kind of where we are. And so we author is Peter, and the, the audience is the church, and the purpose for writing, it says it right here, is to the obedience of Jesus Christ. And Peter's writing to the church, and he's saying, I, I, I'm writing so that you would continue to obey, that you would continue to endure, that you would continue to stay the course. And, and when you do that, it says that grace and peace will be multiplied to you in your life. That when you endure, when you continue, grace and peace, grace, the, the power that allows you to do what God has called you to do, to be who he's called you to, to, to be, and, and peace, the, the supernatural peace that surpasses understanding, the peace that, that allows you to remain the same no matter what the outward circumstances, when you continue to obey, grace and peace are multiplied in your life. He's encouraging them to continue. So we... We know he's asking them to continue to obey, but we also know the context, and we know who he's writing to and what they're going through. So, so Peter isn't writing, asking them to obey to an obvious blessing. It's, it's, it's easy to obey when you know the blessing. It's easy to tell your kids, if you do this, I'll give you this. That's easy. We obey. We get it. Yeah, that's awesome. When, when you get the job you want, it's easy to obey when the blessing is immediate. It's, it's when you get the healing you need. It's easy to obey, but, but, but they're not, that's not what's going on here. Peter is asking them to obey um, um, when it leads to suffering. Oh my gosh, we're talking about this. <laughs> Peter is asking them to obey when it leads to burdens. Peter is asking them to obey when it leads to real pain. Can I just tell you, if you follow Jesus, it will add to the burdens in your life. If you obey Jesus, listen, we need to obey even if it means walking in some serious, deep pain. Following Jesus has added burdens to my life, and I'm sure it's added burdens to yours. But the question is, will I continue Will I continue to follow? Will I continue to obey? You know, it's my love for Jesus that adds burdens to my life in 2020. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but 2020, there's a lot going on. But it's my love for Jesus that adds burdens to my life. It's my love for Jesus that causes me to raise my voice about the unborn children. And I know we might not all agree on that or come to the same terms. That's okay. But it's my love for Jesus when I read in the Bible in Psalms 139 that life begins in the womb. So it's my love for Jesus that causes me to raise my voice up about that. It's my love for Jesus that causes me to stand against racial injustice. It's my love for Jesus that gives me enemies in this world. How many know we have some enemies in this world? But it's the same love of Jesus that asks me to serve my enemies, to love my enemies. If you follow Jesus, it's going to add to the pressure and the pain. And Peter is going to write about is that you're going to have to learn to carry pain. You're going to have to learn to carry pain in this life. But it's not just about carrying pain, it's how we carry pain. And as we get into verse 3, he begins to focus on these two words. It's hope and purpose. Hope and purpose. And Peter shows us two ways in which we are to carry the pain that we will have in this life. And it's hope and purpose. And 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, as we continue, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He says, blessed be God. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, most people wake up looking for a blessing. Most people wake up looking, did God do what he said he was going to do today? Did, did God give me what I asked him for? You know, we ought to not wake up and look for a blessing, but we ought to wake up and be a blessing. It says, blessed be God, that we should wake up and we should begin to bless the name of God. We should wake up and say, God, I'm here. I'm yours. Not my will, but your will be done. I'm going to bless your name today. When I walk out there, people aren't going to see me. They're going to see you. We should be blessing the name of God. Why? It tells us, according to his great mercy. It's his great mercy. We don't get what we deserve. That's what mercy is. And God is not giving you what you deserve. God gives you what he deserves. It's his great mercy in our lives that we should bless the name of God. And that's why we can bless his name. That's why, because he first blessed us. That's why we can love God, because he first loved us. That's why we can serve God, because he first served us. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to your great mercy. It's one of the only things that's new about God is his mercies are new every day for you. Blessed be your name according to your great mercy. For he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because of this great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Uh, born again is a picture of salvation, and, and it's the best way to describe it. One of the best is, is like giving birth. And, and, and Peter isn't using his own words. He's actually using words from Jesus. And I believe it's John chapter 3 when uh, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And Jesus tells him that flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. If you want salvation, you must be born again. And why use the phrase born again? Well, it's the best way to describe coming to Jesus, that when you are born again, you become a new creation. Come on, that's the good news, that you get a brand new start, and it's evident by a new set of desires and a, and a new nature. That the day I gave my life to Jesus doesn't mean that I don't face temptation anymore. It just means that I have a new spirit. My life has new intentions. What used to give me pleasure no longer gives me pleasure anymore. I was walking one way, but now I'm walking a different way. I was thinking one way, but now I think differently. Why? Because I'm born again. I have a new spirit. Well, how are we being born again? He tells us we are being born again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have new life because Jesus was resurrected from the grave. Come on, this is important to us. That the resurrection is everything to your faith. That without an empty tomb, we don't have the resurrection. We don't have new life. We don't have salvation. Listen, it's important to understand what one person said it this way. That when you are born again, what God did for Jesus, he does for you in the very depths of your soul. So Jesus' resurrection is my resurrection. That because of the resurrection, we have new life and we can be born again. I have living hope. Jesus is alive, so we have a living hope. You need hope to survive. It's essential. You've been born again to a living hope. And there's many people, you need food, shelter, water, but how many know, we know a lot of people who had food, shelter, and water, but didn't have hope, and they didn't make it. Hope is essential to survive. And it's because of that Jesus lives that we can face tomorrow. That we need to focus on the hope. And if you're carrying pain today, Peter would say, focus on the hope. You have a living hope. His name is Jesus. And it's not just that we carry pain, but it's how we carry it. Are you carrying it with hope? Are you carrying it with hope? Peter continues to say that to be born again through a 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, being kept in heaven for you. Hope comes with an inheritance. Hope comes with an inheritance. Think of a legacy or a birthright. Just like Peter said, though, you have to understand you have to be born again in order to have salvation. That you're not a son or daughter by worth, but you're a son or daughter by birth. And this is the good news. Because that means you can't achieve Jesus. That means you can't work hard enough to get Jesus, but you have to believe in him in order to get it. You have a living hope, and you must be born again in order to get this inheritance that is being kept for you. How many know a good inheritance isn't just given to you when you want it, but it's given, it, it's given to you when you need it? That God doesn't just give us what we want when we want it. God gives us what we need when we need it. Well, why? Because he's a good father. Because he loves us. Because we might ask for something that we want right now, but it might actually hurt us, and we can't see that. So God gives us what we need when we need it. My inheritance is being kept for me, not from me. I love that. Your inheritance is being kept for you, not from you. That it's imperishable. That means it's not going anywhere. That you're not going to lose it. It's undefiled. That means that your mistakes don't change the value of your inheritance. That what you do has no, has, has no consequences on your inheritance. That it's unfading. It's not getting worse with time. It's, te it's not temporal. It's eternal. You have an inheritance. And we must be reminded because life is going to come at us. And when life tries to weigh us down... Hope relieves the pressure. The greater the pain, the bigger the hope. As pain hits my life, I need hope to relieve the pressure. It kind of reminds me of, of an elevator. Elevators have what's called a counterweight. And the counterweight has to be heavier than the actual elevator itself. So that when the counterweight comes down, the elevator goes up. And just like a count, an elevator has a counterweight, our hope is the counterweight to our pain. Sure. That the greater the pain, the greater the hope needs to be. Hope weighs more than pain does. The world will pound you with burdens, but God blesses you with tons of hope. The world brings burdens in pounds. God brings hope in tons. Tons weigh more than hope. God's mercy, God's grace, God's hope weighs more than our pain. And as hope comes down, the pain goes up. But we don't just need to focus on the hope. The other word was purpose. We had to put some purpose on it. And Peter continues in verse 6 and says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is massive. Literally what Peter is saying, yes, you're going to go through pain. Yes, you're going to go through trials. Yes, you're going to experience hardships. But you must make a decision to rejoice. Rejoice? Why? Well, because when we rejoice, it begins to put purpose on the pain that's all around us. He says, though now for a little while. Peter begins his, this letter this way, and he also ends his letter this way in chapter 5. But he says, though for now, for a little while, and he's drafting off of Jesus' words in, in John 16 when Jesus is talking with his disciples, and Jesus is getting ready to ascend to heaven, and he is already raised from the dead, and he's standing there, he's talking to his disciples, and Jesus tells him, he goes, I'm going to leave for a little while. And then he says, but don't worry, I'm coming back in a little while. Now, I don't know if you know this, but that was like 2,000-something years ago that Jesus said that. If you study the Bible, you'll find that God has a funny relationship with time. <laughs> Jesus says, hey, I'll be back in a little bit. If someone tells me that, I'm not moving. Okay, I I'm, I'm waiting for you. I'll be right here. Well, I wonder what happened on day 
79,000 when, when they're like, okay, so you think he's coming back today? I don't know. The Bible says that a day is like a thousand years to God. The Bible also says that our life is but a vapor. So one way to put a little while, one way to define it would be your entire life. That if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to have to learn how to carry pain your whole life. And Peter is writing to encourage them. Don't give up. Keep going. You have this. You got it. Continue. You're going to experience pain, but remember, put some purpose on it. Put some purpose on it. Trials have purpose in our life. Trials tend to expose who we are by digging up the soil of our life around us and revealing the roots. And so when pain hits my life, when trials hit my life, it starts to dig up all the dirt and all the stuff around me. It begins to expose what I am actually attached to. And Peter uses this metaphor that's not unfamiliar with scripture of gold and fire. That when you take a precious metal and you put it in the fire, the fire begins to expose the impurities in that precious metal. And the impurities rise to the top so that you can clean it off to make it better than it started. And in the same way, when we go through trials, the fire burns and exposes the dirt and impurities in our lives, revealing the true thing that God wants us to be attached to, which is Jesus. Come on, 2020 has been a year of exposure. Come on, people have been exposed to the true thing that their faith has really been attached to. A lot of people have collapsed in 2020. Uh, because of what has hit their life this year. And they collapsed because their, their faith was Jesus plus something. Uh, their faith was Jesus plus my health. Their faith was Jesus plus my job. Their faith was Jesus plus acceptance, plus approval, plus popularity. But how many know that Jesus plus something isn't true faith? That Jesus is the only thing that our faith needs to be attached to. That when trials come, it reveals, okay, I can't be attached to this anymore. I need to grab onto the living hope that I have, which is Jesus, and I need to not let go. Trials refine our character and define our calling. We must put purpose on it. What you're going through, don't just go through it. Grow through it. Your character is being refined. And while others may not be able to tell, you're getting stronger. You're getting wiser. You're moving further ahead. And at the same time, God is making sure that you are, your faith is attached to his son, Jesus. We see this principle in Jesus' life before his public ministry began. That Jesus... Uh, he goes into the wilderness for 40 days. And he's in the wilderness, and the devil comes and tempts him. For 40 days, he tempts him. And in that 40 days, his character is being strengthened. Because we see that he comes out of the wilderness, and he, he goes into the temple. He's been in the, in the wilderness for 40 days in, in, in pain. He's been suffering trials. His character is being strengthened. And the first place he goes is into the temple and he, he grabs a scroll, a scripture, and he opens it up and he begins to read. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover the sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What happened? He was refined. And as his character was refined, his mission and calling was defined. Listen, as you go through the fire, God can use it to declare and define your calling, your mission, what he has for you. 
But you need to put purpose on your pain. I don't know what this year has looked like for you, but if you put some purpose on your pain, if you put some purpose on the suffering, if you put some purpose on the job loss, if you put some purpose on on the sickness, what you'll discover is that you have been refined so that God could define where he wants to take you and what he wants to do with you. This year's been hard. I think everybody can say this year's been difficult. Things that we knew were coming and things that we didn't see. It's been a hard year. But if we can focus on the hope, if we can put some purpose to the pain, God can define the calling and mission he has for your life. God has a plan for you. God has a hope for you. He has a future for you. And this is the blessing of pain. It's because of the fire that God begins to define the mission. So if you're still standing today in 2020, you ought to rejoice. If you're still here, you ought to rejoice because you're further than you were. You've grown since before. You've come all this way. This is the blessing of pain. He says rejoice. Rejoice. And he continues in verse 8 and says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. You haven't seen him, but you love him. And you don't see him now, but you believe in him. It reminds me of when Jesus was, he just been risen from the dead and he was visiting his disciples. And Thomas came in and says, I don't believe it. Show me your hands. Show me your side. And Jesus says, look, Thomas. Touch my hands. Look at my side. He says, but blessed are those who believe and do not see. Though you don't see him now, you love him. And though you haven't seen him, you believe in him. That we ought to rejoice. Yes, I'm suffering. Yes, I'm facing trials. But at the same time, I'm rejoicing. Well, how is that possible? How is it possible that on one hand, you can suffer, but on the other hand, you can rejoice? Well, friends, isn't that the gospel? That, That I can go through both at the same time? Yet I have grace and peace being multiplied in my life that I'm able to continue, that I'm able to endure, that it results in an inexpressible joy down on the inside of me that only comes from deep pain. It's the gospel. You can have more life than death. You can have more peace than chaos, more hope than despair. It reminds me when Paul said, Paul says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. It's the tension It's the season we're in. A joy that is inexpressible and I think the joy that God wants to give you to continue. That joy, is it's not a smiley face emoji joy that's here for a moment and gone the next. It's so much deeper than that. It's a joy that can only be found in deep, deep pain. The joy that helps us carry on, that helps us continue. So how do we continue? 
you take the handle of hope and you take the handle of, of purpose and you begin to walk forward realizing that God is purifying us that he's refining us that there's a purpose that it's not over that you're not at the end but you're still in the middle that there is more to come he says focus on the solution don't let the don't let the division out there become the division in here and don't let the problems out there become the problems in no no focus on the solution we have the answer his name is Jesus Some believe that Peter and Paul were actually in prison at the same time, both writing the same truths to their audience. Peter is known as the apostle of hope. And Paul writes 2 Corinthians 4.16. He says, therefore, we do not give up. We don't give up. We don't quit. We endure. We continue. He says, even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction, it's just for a moment, it's just for a little while, our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory that pain comes in pounds but hope comes in tons so we do not focus on what is seen but we focus on what is unseen for what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal I can continue because my pain is temporary but it's producing and it's achieving an eternal inheritance. I don't give up. I don't lose heart. I focus on the hope. I put some purpose on it. And I continue. If you're here today and you're in this spot, I don't know if I can continue. I don't have hope. It hurts too bad. It's too much to carry. Can I tell you that today there is hope for you? That yes, the world will give you pain, but God's hope outweighs the pain. That you can focus on the hope and you can leave here better than you came in. For a second, I'd like everybody to close their eyes and bow their heads. And if you're here today, or maybe you're watching online. Or maybe it's three months from now and you just somehow came across this YouTube video or Facebook feed and, and you're there and this is for you. You must be born again. That this is where it starts. I don't have hope. I don't know how to put purpose on it. It starts with you receiving salvation. And you can't earn it. You can't achieve it. It's freely given. And you must receive it. And so that's you with every eye closed and head bowed if you're here and you're ready to make that decision. I'm choosing today to give my life to Jesus. I'm not, I'm not saying no to, to, to temptation. I'm saying yes to God's hope and his grace and his peace if that's you today. And you're ready to make that decision. Look, we're not going to call you out. We're not going to make you stand up. But we want to pray with you and believe with you. We want to continue with you. But if that's you, would you just throw a hand up in the air wherever you're at so we can see it? We just want to pray with you right now. Thank you. Well, thank you. Wherever you're at, thank you. Just put a hand up in the air wherever you're at. And thank you. Thank you. If you're watching online, just type yes in the comments. We're all going to repeat this prayer together. I want everybody to repeat. Say, dear Heavenly Father, I know I need you. I need your love. I need your hope. I need your acceptance. I need your forgiveness. So come into my heart. Make me clean. Make me new. 
Today, I choose you. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you for saving me. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Church, can we give a round of applause for every single person who just prayed that prayer? Come on. If you're watching online, come on. Give them some hearts and some thumbs up. It's a good day in the kingdom, and we're not done. And Online, they just pinned a, 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 a connection card in the comment section and if you're in here on your way out the doors they have connection cards for you but if you prayed that prayer we would just ask that you would take a second and fill out the connection card it allows us to begin praying for you right now how many know that the world is coming at you harder than ever before we want to be praying with you and standing with you and believing with you and agreeing with you because we do know that God has plans for you that your best days are yet to come so take a second and fill that connection card out and make sure you get that turned in. But what we're going to do is, you know, this letter, 1 Peter, it would have came to the church. That Peter would have written it probably in prison. And, and he would have sent it to these churches. And the, the church would have, they, you know, they didn't have a podcast or YouTube or, or Facebook. So they, it would have came in a letter and they would have got this letter and sometime in their church service before they worship and that's what we're going to do right now is we're going to worship and we're going to sing to God and you might not have words we're going to put words up on the screen but maybe in this next moment it's just a time for you to begin to to bless the name of God to thank him and praise him to begin to put purpose on your pain to begin to focus on the hope but but they would have got this letter and they would have said hey we have a letter from pastor Peter and they would, have, they would have read the letter. And so what I want is, whether you're watching online or you're in the building, let's stand to our feet and let's begin, let, let's look at this letter and let's read it and let's know that as we read this letter, it results in inexpressible joy. It results in hope and peace. And Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Begin to worship right now. Begin to praise God. Come on, let's sing this out.